Welcome to the Portland Pentecostals podcast. We're happy you've decided to join us as we build a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Enjoy the message. I'm going to start a new series today, and uh, it's going to be out of the book of Habakkuk. Does anybody know who Habakkuk is? Oh yeah, who is he? What does his name mean? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was listening to a guy and he said he was going to start teaching on Habakkuk and he thought, well, I'm going to see how much people know about Habakkuk. And so he went to the mall and he started asking them and one guy said, well, I think it's a, a disease of the lower back. <laughs> Somebody else said, well, I think it's a Jewish religion or right. And, and people had all kinds of ideas, but people really didn't know. But that's the general public. But when we look at a minor prophet, it doesn't mean that his part was minor. That means that his book was shorter. And uh, uh, this guy named Habakkuk, we're going to read several verses of scripture out of chapter 1 and chapter number 2. And the subject matter that we're addressing is the sovereignty of God. Now, the first Sunday of January, I preached a a message on the sovereignty of God, which means God's absolute and, and total control. In other words, he can do what he wants and nobody can stop him from doing what he wants. That doesn't mean he always does what he wants in our life because we push away from him, but ultimately God gets done what he wants to get done. He finds a way to do it because He lives in timelessness, and the God that we serve, we believe was, always was, always will be. He lives outside of this bubble that we live in, uh, this capsule called time, and therefore he sees the end from the beginning. He knows what's going on. It's kind of like you and I, and I've used an illustration before of an ant or a bug that's crawling along the ground. And I, I, I kind of was messing with a spider the other day. I found a spider walking across the floor in my bedroom. And so I stuck my foot in front of him and he turned around and I stuck it behind him and he turned around and I just started going in circles. <laughs> just see what, that's kind of cruel, huh? Just to see what the spider would do. And I could kind of project, if I put my foot in front of him, he'd turn and go one of the other three ways. But if I put it on both sides, front and back, he'd go left or right. And, and that's kind of the way I see God seeing us. Is he's so large, he's so big, he lives in a different scope of things. It's like him looking down on our minute lives, and he can see a much bigger picture than what we can see. We can only see in the dark as far as our headlights will allow us. We can, so, we can only see clearly just so far depending upon the health of our optic nerves. And there's a limit to mankind and there's all kinds of things that can change that. It can rain, it can be foggy, it can be cloudy. Uh, and that can change how far we can see or the sun can get in our eyes and that can impact how far we can see. But God's not affected by any of that because he lives outside of that. And God is love and God is light and he's the things that we wish we would exude in our life or at least we wish others would exude toward us. And so this man that we're going to read from, he's a prophet named Habakkuk and his name actually means to hug. Now, I don't know where he got that name. I don't know how he got that. You know, Esau was because he was red and hairy all over like a garment. And so they named him Esau. And uh, Jacob was the heel grabber. And so they named him deceiver or supplanter or heel grabber. And and usually in the Hebrew uh, nation, they waited until the child, the male, was eight years old and he was circumcised and they gave him the name at that time, just like we remember uh, the prophet uh, saw the the vision and and came out and he couldn't tell his wife uh, that she was going to have a child and so he had to write it down and his lips were sealed until his son was born and they thought, oh, he's going to name Zacharias after himself and he says, no, his name's John. Ah. That was unusual because nobody in the family was named John, but he had a purpose and a design and so Sometimes we have been named by others, and 
Sometimes we allow circumstances to name us, but God has a calling on our life. And I'm hoping by the time we're done with this mini-series, I told Pastor Anthony it might be three weeks. Now after today, it might be four weeks. We'll see. I have a little bit of time because to understand just the book of Habakkuk, it, it really reveals to us that this man understood God's sovereignty. Not only did he understand it, but we're going to see next week that he embraced God's sovereignty. So those are two different things. It's one thing to realize you're broke, and it's another thing to claim responsibility and do something to get out of it or to work yourself out of the hole. It's one thing to realize you've just cut your finger, and it's another thing to go to the doctor or have somebody help you doctor that finger so that the bleeding stops so it can be healed. And so that's the, what I want us to get to the place that at the end of my series of lessons, we're going to leave some time for prayer, and I'm going to shorten my last lesson and give us a chance to surrender to the sovereignty of God and say, okay, God, whatever you want to do in my life, I'm good with that, kind of. <laughs> and what we're going to see is that just because God is working doesn't mean it's comfortable. Right. <laughs> because think about it. God is so much larger than us and bigger than us even if he asked us to do something he could do, it, something that he could just think and do, it would take a super amount of energy for us to do. And we understand, those of us that are adults that are responsible, that everything of value uh, has a price. And many times, not always, but many times the things of the greatest value have the greatest price. And so it takes a while to obtain that thing or uh, just like... I was watching a deal. There was a boy that they named the Hulk. And uh, at eight years old, he was the strongest boy in the world. And he had his six-pack. And he was lifting weights. And that, his name was Craig Tuttle, I think, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, they were showing pictures of him. And they say, where is he now? And they did an interview. And he just looked like a normal guy. In fact, he had a little bit of what I have. And so I felt pretty good. And they asked him, do you lift weights? And he said, not at all. And I said, he said, they said, why? He said, it just got boring. And now he's into music and something else, and he's got a career uh, doing something else. But he made it big from the age of about 8 till 14, and then he just disappeared off the screen, and nobody knew where he went, and this person was catching up with him. And so even things that we value at one point in life they lose their value at another point in life. And so what happens when we submit to the sovereignty of God, it's not like he rips something out of my hand, unless he has to, to save me. But it's like he leads me in a progression where I slowly let go. And have you ever let go of something and it took a while and then all of a sudden it just goes... It's kind of like pushing the car and rocking it, and then that one more rock, and boom, and everybody falls on their face, and the car goes down the street. Is that there are moments in time where it's quick, it's uh, emphatic, but oftentimes the process leading up to that release or that receiving is rather lengthy. And so what we're going to see is uh, Habakkuk going through a conversations with God. So... Habakkuk 1 and 1 says, and this is the message that the prophet Habakkuk received from the Lord in a vision. And then he comes with his complaint or his question. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence, I cry, but you do not come. Must I forever see this sin and misery all around me? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and useless. There is no justice given in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous. And justice is perverted with bribery and tricks. And the Lord gives his initial reply. And the reason why I say that is as we read through the book of Habakkuk, you're going to see complaint, waiting, response, or reply. And it's a cycle that happens throughout the book. And the Lord replied, look at the nations and be amazed. Watch and be astounded at what I will do. So I think it's important that we see that phrase, at what I will do. So everything else in this book that God declares, it's about what he is going to do. 
So Habakkuk's having this conversation. Well, we'll break it down a little later. So he says, what I will do, for I am doing something in your own day. Something you wouldn't believe in even if I told you about it. <laughs> and sometimes we feel like, well, tell me, God. Try me. I'm raising up the Babylonians to be a new power on the world scene. They are a cruel and violent nation who will march across the world and conquer it. They are notorious for their cruelty. They do as they like and no one can stop them. So isn't this crazy that God, who is love and who is light and who is all things good, says, I'm raising up a new superpower and they're cruel. But remember, God has a purpose for everything he does. And remember, there's cause and effect that we have to deal with in our lives. And then we're going to skip down to verse number 12. And Habakkuk has a second complaint. Does this sound human almost? Does this sound juvenile almost? Okay. He says, oh, Lord, my God, oh, my Holy One, you are eternal. Is your plan in all of this to wipe us out? Surely not, oh, Lord, our rock. You have decreed the rise of the Babylonians to punish and correct us for our terrible sins. So he understands this is a consequence of their, their idolatry, their sins. And, and they had become not just a, a little tainted, but they were quite vile. And then in verse number one, we've skipped several verses after he lays out his complaint to God again, and it's quite lengthy, he says, I will climb up to my watchtower now and wait to see what the Lord will say to me and how he will answer my complaint. Now, the Amplified Version adds adjectives and adverbs, and it kind of makes it really clear as we read this verse. Oh, I know I have been rash to talk out plainly this way to God. I will in my thinking stand upon my post of observation and station myself on the tower or fortress and will watch to see what he will say within me and what answer I will make as his mouthpiece to the perplexities of my complaint against him. Now, this makes me think a little bit about Job. Anybody read a little bit of Job? Uh, Bible theologians say that's the oldest book of the Bible that it was written and he lived before uh, Moses, he lived before the Exodus, before all of that. And so somewhere in the, in the middle of Genesis would have been his existence and, and he's complaining to God. But the beautiful thing is, is God doesn't reject him because it's to God. It's a prayer. It's a question. And so it's not that we complain or we don't understand or we have questions that's the problem. It's the attitude with which we ask the question. God wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear what you're thinking. Yes, I know he knows the thoughts and the intents of the heart, but he wants you and I to express what we're thinking. The beauty about that is sometimes as we express what we're thinking, we change what we're thinking. Sometimes I've you know, in the mid-sentence, at least talking to God with people, I've not been as fortunate to do this. I bite and get blood from my tongue because, oops, I shouldn't be doing that right now. I shouldn't say it that way. I shouldn't phrase it that way. So he has a complaint, and it's listed as a complaint to God. But then he's waiting for God's answer. I love the fact that God does answer. I just don't like that he doesn't answer quick enough most of the time. He's really slow, you know that? I don't know if he even has the same calendar. Is he on the Gregorian calendar? He, you know, you, what year is it to him, to God? I mean, after a while you get old enough to realize that it doesn't matter what year it is, it's a, it's a year. And all that matters is it's morning and night and you have a birthday and it doesn't feel near as special as it did. It feels especially achy maybe, but it doesn't feel near as, and you know, we don't anticipate that day that, oh, I can't wait for my birthday. And some of you are probably at that point where you're saying, I'm 39 and holding. <laughs> I know, you have been for 20 years, I've known you that long. And you're still 39. 
but he's waiting. In his musings, they begin with, is it not reasonable to assume that since I'm God's chosen and beloved, I will get for favorable treatment with God from the God who favors me extravagantly? So he's speaking almost as if God's going to cut me a break. He's going he's to say, well, it's, it's, it's my favorite child. It is natural to expect that from the time that I become his follower, I will be exempt from dead ends, muddy detours, and cruel treatment from those who are walking in the other direction. The God followers don't get professional treatment or preferential treatment in life always comes as a surprise. Yes, some of us need professional treatment. But it's also a surprise to find that there are men and women within the Bible who show up alongside us at such moments. And the prophet, prophet Habakkuk is one of them, and the most welcome companion he is. Most prophets, most of the time, speak God's words to us, and they are preachers calling us to salvation, or, or they're preachers calling us out in judgment or confrontation or comfort. They face us with God as he is, not as we imagine him to be. And most prophets are in your face assertive, not given to tact and not very diplomatic at all. You read some of these. Jonah starts out, the burden of Jonah to Nineveh. The burden of Obadiah. It's negative because they're warning most of the time, and most of the contemporaries of Habakkuk are doing that way, but Habakkuk speaks our word to God. And oh, what a difference it is what we're saying to God compared to what God would say to us. But I like this because it reveals some things about my heart that I realize that, you know what, I'm not so much different than the prophets of old. Now, that doesn't give me right to justify any misbehavior, but it says, you know, they weren't superheroes in capes and tights. Well, God wouldn't have put them in tights anyway if there were guys, but <laughs> they were just... <laughs> One of my grandkids went to the Nutcracker or something, and she came home and she says, and she said it was rather uncomfortable, all those guys in tights. <laughs> And I said, good, I'm glad you feel that way. <laughs> and then she used the word awkward, I think. So he gives voice to our bewilderment and articulates our puzzled attempts to make sense of things and faces God with our disappointment. And he insists that God pay attention to us. And he insists with the prophet's characteristic, no nonsense bluntness. So in spe instead of speaking no-nonsense bluntness to us or to humanity, he's speaking that way to God. Not arrogantly, but very bluntly. And I've found that I speak that way to God, but God speaks that way to me. Now, some of you, God speaks to, to you and says, sweetheart, it's going to be fine. And God speaks to me and says, quit your whining. You're all right. Because he speaks kind of in my own voice in my own head voice to me. Has anybody figured that out in your life? Is that, that's the way it is because uh, that's what we understand. It's, and that's the mercy of God that he does that. And that's one of the beauties of having different teaching and preaching styles exposed to the church is because there's preachers that preach things that if I preach it, it makes no sense to you. And you preach it and you go, oh, that was the best sermon I ever heard in my life. And I'm scratching my head and say, that's random. Because we're so different from each other. And that's why there's so many commentators or programs that we watch or books that we read. And some people read one kind of book and they love it. And the other people say that's trash. And, and uh, because we're so different. So this man speaks to God kind of like I would speak to God. So I like him. And the circumstance that aroused Habakkuk took place about the 7th century B.C., the prophet realized that God was going to use a godless military machine of Babylon to bring his judgment on his own people. Use a godless nation to per punish a godly nation? Well, maybe it should be phrased using a godless nation to, produce, to punish a God-called nation. 
It doesn't make, didn't make sense that, and Habakkuk was quick and bold to say so, and not a day passed since then that one of us haven't picked up and repeated Habakkuk's bafflement. God, you don't seem to make sense. But this prophet companion who stands at our side and does something even more important, waits and he listens for God to answer. And that's where I have a problem. Maybe not you, but I do. Because sometimes I want to think, well, I'm smart enough to figure that out, even though I ask God the question. It's almost like we ask God what we think are rhetorical questions. That means a question that we think the answer is obvious to. Uh, uh, what color is this shirt? Oh, gray. I remember my grandchildren learning their colors and say, and I'll say, that's pink, no green. Pink, no green. And you kind of test them and it says, no, there's an absolute in their mind and they already have the answer to what it is. And sometimes we ask God expecting that he's going to answer exactly how we think he should answer and it's just totally messes with our brain. And that's what's happened with Habakkuk in this short book of the Bible. And so only there does he eventually, so he finds himself praying. That, and, and that he finds himself in inhabiting the large world of God's will or sovereignty. And only there does he eventually realize that the believing in God life, the steady trusting in God life, is the full life and the only real life. And Habakkuk starts, Habakkuk starts out exactly where we start out in our puzzled complaints and God accusations. But he doesn't stay there. He ends up in a world along with us where every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. And we're going to see his complaints through chapter 1, 2, and 3, and by the end of it, he's having a party. And he still knows the judgment that's coming for the nation. And he still knows, and then he understands it's God's righteous judgment. And then he understands that it's judgment that must come for correction, not for destruction. And that's when he begins to celebrate. And so Habakkuk, the prophet of God, lived in a time of upheaval in his world. He's a man filled with integrity in a world that is grossly lacking in this characteristic. And he's done his best to be right with God and right with his fellow man. And his contemporaries were Jeremiah and Zephaniah and Nahum. The most, prophet, most pro, the most prolific was Jeremiah, and he's the major prophet. And you go and read Jeremiah, and I thank God he didn't call me to be Jeremiah. You look at Jeremiah. Uh, Habakkuk got off easy. All he had to do is complain to God. Jeremiah had to build little cities and then knock them over and lay on one side for days and then lay on another side and cook his, his food with donkey dung and walk around the country with his backside bare and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, hi, pastor. No, nope, that's not my pastor. Uh -uh. He was living out before the nation what God, how God saw them. And sometimes the thing that is the greatest motivator for change for you and I is to see somebody else acting just like we act. And we go, man, wow. And that's not a good look. You know, they're chewing out the individual that's in the, in the grocery store like we did last week, and we're thinking, what an idiot. And then we're going, oh, I'm an idiot. And sometimes God allows those things in order to give us a fresh view of the change that needs to happen in our life. So Habakkuk is frustrated in the world in which he lives, and the world is falling apart around him, and his people were divided. You know, it used to be Israel, and then uh, about 60 years prior to uh, Judah going away into captivity, it splits up. Well, actually, it's longer than that. It's a couple hundred years. And, the, and Rehoboam becomes the king instead of his dad, Solomon. And, and, and he says to his buddies, hey, how should I treat everybody? And he says, well, you tell them if you thought my dad's taxes were tough, uh, my big toe's going to be heavier than this foot. And I, if you think he was tough, I'm really tough. 
And he listened to the young guys that told him to do that rather than the aged that said, no, you need to change your approach. And so the kingdom was split and Jeroboam ended up with two tribes and he ended up with 10. And so we see that the nation is split and so you have Israel in the north and Judah in the south and Judah is comprised just of Benjamin and Judah, those two tribes. And Jerusalem is their, cap their capital and the 10 tribes of Israel had years before the writing of Habakkuk been carried away into captivity because of their sin. Now if you look at Israel compared to Judah, all of the monarchs in Israel were evil. There were a couple of good ones in Judah. So they got a little more time because God's merciful. But when you have totally corrupt leaders, it ends up with corruption among the people because our leaders lead us. And the inhabitants of Judah had a front row seat to watch the exodus of their fellow Hebrews into captivity. And at the time of Habakkuk writing, Jehoiakim is likely the king of Judah, and King Jehoiakim is evil, evil. Therefore, God sees Judah as wayward and says, I have to punish you. So we read again verse number three of chapter number one of Habakkuk. Must I forever see this sin and misery all around me? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I'm surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. In other words... It's a political election year, but it's not. He's saying, why look at what's around me? So he acknowledges that there are problems and God was bound by his word to respond to their waywardness with punishment. Therefore, Habakkuk is waiting to see what the outcome or end result would be. The waiting. Everyone in a general sense, is waiting for something. Yeah. We're waiting for a raise. We're waiting for that new house. We're waiting for that neighbor to say, I'm sorry. We're waiting for our kid to grow up. We're waiting for our wrinkles to go away. And that stuff we've been putting under our eyes is just not working. We're waiting. Everyone is waiting for a prayer to be answered or, or everyone is waiting for some answer to the life issue. You may have forgotten that you even asked the question, and then one day you have the answer. Everyone is, of us is, will pass a point in life where we do not understand why. Why the waiting? Why the pain? Why the fear? Why the evil instead of the good? Why the silence? Why that answer? So you are a part of that everyone waiting in our day. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting on the Lord for it? Because Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. But that waiting isn't a waiting where we're just in limbo. They that wait on the Lord, those that serve the Lord, like a servant, they'll run, they'll mount up. But we don't fly every day, do we? Aren't you glad that every day is not your six-year-old's birthday? I think there was a movie somewhere where somebody wished it was their birthday every day. Wasn't there something like that? And it was the same day over and over and over and over again. Groundhog Day. Huh? Groundhog Day. Groundhog Day. Oh, okay. And eventually it was like, ah! Because it was such a good day, they wanted to relieve that, live that good day. But then what was wonderful at one time becomes just like unbearable. Yeah. So God allows life to breathe. He allows us to breathe, and he's taking us on a journey. Is there an answer that you seek today? I'm a part of that everyone today. Habakkuk was a part of that everyone in his day, and Habakkuk knew that Judah was running headlong toward destruction. Habakkuk knew that the only, only a change of heart and action in mass would change the destination of the nation he was a part of. We see that, don't we? Yeah. It's like people saying, well, you have too much credit card debt. If we all just keep going in that direction and we'll hear Steve Forbes or, or Larry Kudlow or, or what's his name, Payne, tell us all that we need to draw back in and not spend on our credit cards. And, the, and then the next month they say, credit card spending is up. 
default is up. It's like we hear the warnings from those people in, the, in, in those positions about the economy and we still in mass or as a group, some obey and others don't. Why is it that humanity, it, it, this just popped into my mind, what was the name of his, what was his name? I forgot his name. Remember when Mount St. Helens erupted? Anybody remember that? Harry True. Harry True. Yes. Whew. That's my man. He saved me. Harry Truman. Not the president, Harry Truman. <laughs> you not S instead of R. Okay. So they were warning us for months that Mount St. Helens was going to blow. And there was the Spirit Lake Resort up on the mountain, and old Harry Truman said, ah, if she shoots her rod, she shoots her rod. I've been up here for decades. I'm going to be fine. And she, he stayed there, and he's still there. Well, his remains might be down in Longview somewhere <laughs> or at the bottom of Spirit Lake, but I remember when the mountain blew and days after and weeks after, they went in, they had a hard time getting in there and there were 50 some people that died. And most of them that died, it was because they refused the admonition of the authorities to stay off the mountain. You know, some of us are fire truck chasers. We just can't not. I was watching it the other day. One of these shorts popped up on YouTube and I'm like, I want to watch it, but you kind of want to turn away. And it was a guy on a mountain bike, and he's running down, and it's in Utah somewhere, and he's running down the hill, and then you see him jump, and it's just almost a cliff. And he lands again, and he swoops again, and lands on the other side, and I'm going, no, i got to watch that again. <laughs> and sometimes life feels that way, doesn't it? It's just like, oh, I don't want to feel, oh, oh. and pretty soon we, we can get deadened to it. Because we know he's going to land safe. And so we watch it again and again, and, it's, and the fear goes away. But the first few times you watch it, the fear is there. Or one of those guys in the wing suits that doesn't operate as it should, and he's going in a fjord over in Norway, and it's just like you see him spinning out of control. Anybody want to go with me? Too bad, because I'm not going. But the true prophet was wanting a timeline from God. Have you ever wanted a timeline from God? It's like, oh, man, yeah. I mean, whether it's a, a, an education, we want the timeline. If it's preparing for marriage, we want the timeline. If it's buying a house, we want the timeline. Major things, we want the timeline. If it's a contractual agreement, they want to know when it's going to be delivered and what stages it's going to be delivered in. But a true prophet does not always have the answers. The true prophet often does not have the answers you want, and the true prophet often does not have the answers that he wants. There was a time that this happened often at the church, and, and we do believe in the gifts of the prophecy, prophecy and prophets, and, and people would come in and say, do you have a prophet in the church? And I said, oh, yeah, we have prophets in the church. Uh, well, I need to talk to them because I need a prophecy. And I said, well, it doesn't work that way. We don't tell God when to prophesy. God tells us when he's ready to prophesy. We don't tell God when to talk. We just got to be listening when God does talk. And that's a whole lot harder, isn't it? And, and, and I'm not saying we're wrong in the way we do it, and we've got to have a schedule, but God is not limited to Sunday morning at 9.15 or 11.15 or Tuesday night at 7.30 or a youth service or some special event. He's not limited by time and space of when he talks, so we've got to be listening to say, God, are you speaking to me? And we know we're going to see here, he speaks through circumstance. He speaks through voices of others. He speaks through his word. He just speaks by his spirit through impressions that we have within ourselves. And you'll notice that one of the verses we read, he's saying, I'm going to sit here and wait on my watchtower and see how God speaks within me. Yeah. He wasn't looking for an audible from God. He was looking for that voice within. Why? Because he knew he was a prophet. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. He knew what the voice of God was, and he knew the voice of God was often not an audible. And it's often not an audible in my life. But I hear and know the voice of God. So the true prophet 
of God can only speak what he sees or hears from God. The true prophet cannot speak against the purpose of God and remain a true prophet. Remember Balaam in the Bible? When, when they said, hey, come and prophesy, and he wanted to go, and, and God says, no. He says, come and prophesy. We'll give you lots of money and a position. And no, we can't do it. And finally he said, I'm going to go, but I can only say what God tells me to go, say. And then he's on his donkey, you know, and he's riding toward the destination, and the donkey wants to buck him off, and he starts beating the donkey, and the donkey turns around and says, you idiot, can't you see the angel with the sword? And so God can speak through donkeys, so there's hope for you, and it happens. Amen. And me. Even through stubborn individuals. And then he was kind of friends with his donkey again. You know, it's like the car's not running right and you hate it, and then all of a sudden it's running right again. I said, this is the best car I've ever owned for the price I paid. And sometimes you've wiggled some wires and sometimes you just realize there was water in the gas or you, there was something kooky and all, all of a sudden it's running right again. But when Balaam did finally get there, he warned the king. He says, now I can only speak what God tells me to speak because these are God's people. So he speaks something positive about him. And he said, that's not what I hired you to do. He says, well, I can only speak what God tells me to speak. So that's why Habakkuk is waiting. Because there's, we called it name it and claim it at one time. Some people called it word of faith. Uh, it had other names that it was given to it where people believed if we had a will, we just speak it into existence. God, I want that new car. It's like I told you, I had a friend that said he spoke into existence an Oldsmobile. And I said, well, you stopped way short of where I would have. Why only an Oldsmobile? You know, and there was that deal that if you were right with God, you could speak into existence that career or that, that position or that possession, and it would happen. And if it didn't, there must be something wrong with you. You could speak a healing into existence. And if you didn't, I remember my wife spoke many times with a lady. She just felt condemned, like she couldn't go to church anymore at all because they told her, there's got to be something wrong with your heart because God's not healing with you. I got news for you. Every one of the apostles died. Oh, but John was murdered. But John had to die of a natural death. And we don't know what he died of. I mean, my doctor wasn't there to check him out. So I don't trust it. So God is working and God is speaking. The true prophet may not like what he sees or hears when God tells him what to speak. The true prophet doesn't have permission to speak the present or the future of God, for God's people out of his own heart or desire, as we mentioned with Balaam. And the true prophet does not always have the answers. Sometimes we don't know. Sometimes God doesn't say yes or no or maybe or wait or anything. There's no sign, so we just have to wait. Yeah. So that's why Habakkuk says, I'm, here's my complaint, now I'm going to wait. How long? Oh, I hate it. He didn't say. He just said, wait. He didn't say six hours or a day or till the 50th, 50th day after or to the Feast of Pentecost. He just said, I'll wait and see what he says in my heart. So the true prophet knows God always has the answer. And he knows that he must wait for the answer from God. The true prophet also knows how to connect with God. So the book of Habakkuk is a series of observations by Habakkuk, questions or complaints to God, and then waiting for the answers, and then God giving the answers. And what's interesting, there are sometimes, it looks like most of the time, it's a short question, and God's answers are really long. He has the full explanation. He's given the total reason to him. This is a mirror of the pattern of life, not just the life of Habakkuk, but life in general. Observation, questions, waiting, answers. And they don't always come in the sequence we expect it to. It's like we ask a question or we have a prayer or make a complaint and God doesn't answer that and something else happens in life and we talk to him about that and we may be three or five years down the road and then all of a sudden God speaks and we go, oh, I forgot I asked. 
because we get, got distracted from the immediate crisis and we're on till another crisis and we've got to make sure that we're not just firemen putting out fires everywhere and that the only time we talk to God is when we have a complaint. But hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Is God speaking to my life? Is that me or? Yeah. It's right up here. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Often the answers do not contain the words we want, and sometimes the answers contain rebuke. And in seasons, the answers bring comfort. But only God always has the answers. There's some things I'll never have the answer to. It's not given to me. We're not God, therefore we observe with limited knowledge. We wonder, we question, and we wait. And we depend on Him. I was watching a short, uh, they've got a new uh, uh, satellite out. Hubble looks at small uh, sections of our universe and they're getting all these Im images back, but they sent a new satellite out so that they can look at bigger swaths of the universe and get a bigger picture and map the whole universe, they say. And you know, it's trillions of light years away, so we can prepare if an asteroid's going to hit Earth in, you know, 50 billion years when nothing's written on paper anymore and the hard drive crashes, so nobody's going to know. So we wonder, but God says through Isaiah in chapter 46 and verse number 9, remember the former things of old. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me. And then this next verse, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. I am so glad I know the God who has the answers. Not just casually, but intimately. I know his character. I know his track record. I know his word. And I know his love. And sometimes that's the only things that give me comfort. Because I don't have the answers. I can look at politics and say, well, this is how it needs to work out in order to come out like I want it to work out. But that's not mine to control. I can look, even look at my, the, my personal economics and my personal career path and all of my financial plannings and say, this is the way I'm going to do it. And the Bible says, occupy till I come. So we're supposed to be aware, but we cannot predict it. I remember they told us, if you put $25,000 away by the time you're 25, you'll be a millionaire when you retire. They lied. I watched that 25,000 climb up to about 50 and then dash to about 11. And then I watched it climb up to about 22 and then dash to about 8. And now it's back up decent again. But it's nowhere near a million. And it's, but they say, you know, you just got to trust the market. It's not when you get in or when you get out, it's how long you stay. Yeah, it's just, are you alive long enough to stay long enough to, to swing back up? Because people, it crashed in 29 and people just didn't know what to do. And of course, some of this they were saying on the hills of the 1980s when my dad was getting 17 and three quarters percent on interest bearing accounts. And that was common. But so were 12 and three quarter interest rates on a house loan. So just decide what you want, guys. <laughs> and so we base our expectation on the future upon current experience or past experience. But God doesn't live that way. He doesn't live in a little microcosm. It's just like we look at it and say, global warming. Well, they've changed it to climate change now. And, and uh, somebody said to me, well, it was, I think it was Brother Jan, John, somebody asked him about climate change. And he says, look out the window. He says, yeah, is there ice out there? There wasn't that day. And he says, well, they say there was an ice age, but isn't anyone ever knew in an ice age right now? But it didn't happen overnight, and, and we can't control that. And, and this isn't a political announcement. I'm just saying to you that several years ago, it was like about 15 years ago, they were saying we need to breach all the dams on the Columbia because we need to lower the temperature of the Columbia so we get better salmon runs. And the next year, they had better snowpack and the temperature lowered by three degrees in the Columbia and they had record runs of salmon. But my brother Justin will tell you almost record runs last year, but nobody's catching them. 
So it doesn't matter if they're running. They're not biting. We want record catches, not record runs. I don't want to go fishing. I, don't want, to, I want to go catching. I don't want to go hunting. I want to go killing. You know, it's like I, I want to have a harvest. And, and sometimes that translates so much into our spiritual life that we want things to be as we plan them to be. But I promise you, as we end with Habakkuk and then we go into some of the Old Testament characters and New Testament characters, God's plan for me and you is much greater than our own plan for us. That's why we came to him broken and bruised and battered and disillusioned and addicted and fearful and full of anxiety and look we found peace and joy and gladness we were lonely and he put us in a family and if we could see that just in this little microcosm in this short lifespan God's good so I'm glad God knows the answers. And Habakkuk says, why do you allow this behavior? How long will you allow this system to go unchecked? And he makes some astute observations. Unrighteousness is rampant. Corruption is running deep. The law is paralyzed and useless. The courts are refusing to administer justice. The officials who are in charge are enforcing the law only by being bribed or not enforcing the law. The wicked outnumber the righteous. And what God answers Habakkuk he does not dispute any of the complaints. He says, you're right. You see it, Habakkuk. But God says, look at the nations and be amazed. Watch what I'm going to do. See, God is not asking for permission. He's declaring that he's going to do something. He's just saying, well, if you'll ask me, I'll do it. No, he's saying, you just sit back and watch, Habakkuk. I'm working in your own day. It's sometimes easier to see what God is doing in the life of someone else than in our own life. You cannot wrap your brain around what I'm doing is what God says. I'm raising up the Babylonians. They will be a world superpower. And then he goes on to say, they're notoriously cruel. They're violent. They march across the world. They will conquer the world. They will do what they want. No one can stop them. Their horses are faster than leopards. Their people are fiercer than wolves while the sun is going down. It's like the evening hunt when you go out. I hate the evening hunt. I like the morning hunt. Evening hunt. Every tree stump turns into a bear. And, you know, anybody relate to that, you hunters? Oh, yeah. And it's like then you got to uh, go out with a flashlight and you say, where was that lodgepole pine? Am I in the right gully? Did I come in the right way? Everything changes as the sun goes down. So he says, they're like wolves and the sun going down. They are like eagles swooping on their prey. They are all bent on violence. Their hordes are like winds of the desert sweeping their captives ahead of them like the sand. In other words, who can stop that? And listen to the wrap-up of the description of this new world superpower that God is allowing to rise in Habakkuk 1 and 9. They scoff at the kings and princes and scorn all their defenses. They simply pile ramps on earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone. But they are deeply guilty for their own strength is their God. What a horrible world in which to, to live and what a disastrous future. But remember, God said, I'm working in your own day. And God really does, does he really work this way? Would he use cruel people? Does he empower the violent? He has, and he will. But again, the prophet who sees through the glass darkly is stunned and provoked to pray again. Remember, there's likely a pause between his hearing and his praying and his praying and the answer. And we read again Habakkuk 1 and 12. Oh, Lord God, my Holy One, you are eternal. Is your plan in all this to wipe us out? Surely not, O oh Lord, our rock. Uh, you have decreed the rise of the Babylonians to punish and correct us for our terrible sins. And then the typical human-like fashion, Habakkuk lays out his words, and this is a human thinking versus God's thinking. And I'm going to read quickly through this, and I'd encourage you to read it when you get home. Habakkuk 1 and 13. You are perfectly just in this, God, but will you who cannot allow sin in any form stand idly by while they swallow us up? Should you be silent while the wicked destroy people who are more righteous than they? Well, none of us in this room have ever compared our righteousness with others. <laughs> Surely we've never reflected on our sin and said, well, theirs is worse than mine. 
And then verse 14, are we but fish to be caught and killed? Are we but creeping things that have no leader to defend them from uh, uh, their enemies? And sometimes we feel less than. And, and we only feel as valuable as an animal or the fish of the sea. And then he says, must we be strung up on the hooks and dragged out in their nets while they rejoice? Then they will worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are gods who have made me, us rich, they will claim. You will let them get away. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless consequence? And once again... Habakkuk 2 and 1. Oh, I know I have asked, been rash to talk out plainly to this, this way to God. But I will, in my thinking, stand up on my post of observation and station myself on a tower or fortress and will watch to see what he will say within me and what answer I will make as his mouthpiece to the perplexities of my complaint against him. So perhaps you've been actively complaining or reasoning or praying to God. Maybe you're in the waiting period, anxiously waiting or biting your nails or peacefully anticipating the answer. But God's answers are much wordier than Habakkuk's questions. And next week we'll talk about God's answers to Habakkuk. And then we'll talk about how it ends. And it's one of those, not novels, but it almost seems like a novel that gets really bad before it gets really good. But there is a winner and a loser. But the winner is the one who puts their trust in Almighty God. And we're going to see, because he sees clearly that God is sovereign, and, and, and the sovereignty of God has a plan that's much bigger than my plan. Yeah. And I'm going to close with this example as we stand. And I know it's an old TV show, but you know, most of you, that I like cars. And I always say, hey, I... I'd like to have a 67 to a 69 convertible Camaro and I want to fix it up. And I had a neighbor that had one and it was a beater and he fixed on it and fixed on it. And one day I took Brother Tony over there with a friend and said, look at this. And I peeled back the tarp and it was all painted. And I went and knocked on Craig's door and I said, what'd you do? And he says, it's done, Steve. Well, about a year and a half ago, I went and knocked at his door and I said, remember me, Craig? He says, yeah, I remember you, Steve. I said, I want right a first refusal. Are you ready to sell me that? And he said, well, I got X amount of dollars invested in it. I said, I'll go to the bank and get the cash right now and pay you that. Name me a price. He promised he'd come by and give me a ride in it. It's a 67 Camaro Rally Sport Super Sport. Yeah, nice. Yellow with the bumblebee stripe around it. Convertible. Yeah, I'd want one of those. I'd like that. But most of them that I see, the guys that have the real nice ones, I just watched them go across Barrett Jackson or Meekum and I went, I'm going to have to keep wanting because I can't afford that, baby. <laughs> and you and I can look at life and we can have expectations and wants and desires. But we've got to realize that God has something much better planned for us than we could plan for ourselves. Because every car is going to get dented or scratched. Every pair of pants is going to, uh, <laughs> you're going to outgrow. <laughs> you know, every sweater stretches. Every white shirt gets ring around the collar eventually. Every house needs painting. Every floor gets scuffed. Everything temporal that we have. But we can have relationship with one another and with God. And those are two things we can take to heaven with us. Yeah. Is that one day we'll walk among the righteous and we'll look and say, I think I know him. I think I know her. I'm not sure how, but we will know even as we are known. Mm -hmm. And we'll be like him. I can't wait for that day. But in the meantime, we're going to go back to some darkness tomorrow or next week. And maybe we'll end up at the end next week or it might be the week after and see the end of the story and how Habakkuk sees all the answers of God in the rearview mirror. And he can write it down. And this is like a journal, which I'm horrible at doing. But if we'd ever journal, we'll find out that the good outweighs the bad. 
Thank you, God, for your sovereignty. Thank you, Lord, that you who see everything and know everything and have known the end from the beginning have invited us to walk alongside you and have told us that you have a plan for us and you will order our steps and when we're done, you'll receive us into glory. I pray, God, that a hunger would arise in my heart, in our hearts, for you to be in control. Reveal your will and purpose. We want you to work because we don't trust ourselves and we don't trust man and we surely do not trust the enemy of our soul. But you are love, you are light, you are faithful, you have filled us with your spirit, you have redeemed us by your blood, and we thank you for that. Walk with us, live in us, and breathe through us, and may your joy fill our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.